Hi class. In this video, we're going to be looking at the chapter one presentation from our textbook. It has a lot of great information, so I'd recommend you keep some notes. And a great place to do that is OneNote. I'm going to bring that up real fast. You can get a copy of OneNote with your free OTC Office software. Just go to office.com and log in with your OTC account and you can download Office for free. I want to create a new notebook for my notes, so I'm going to choose File, New, and I'm going to put this on my OneDrive so that I can get to it from other locations. And I already have a OneNote notebook folder set up there. So let's say I want to call this CIS 150 SU 18. Create that notebook. Sorry if that's loud. I'll turn it down a little bit. Now in um, OneNote, you have a notebook layout and you have tabs in your notebook that you can label. You can add new tabs. And within each tab, you can have many different sections. So you can kind of organize things however you like. I'm going to set up this first tab as chapter one, maybe. And I could actually embed the PowerPoint into my OneNote notebook if I wanted to. Take up a little bit of space, but that's a possibility. So you can organize things however you like. I'm going to start out a notes section that has to do with chapter one, and then I'll minimize this and try to remember to add some notes to it to cue you as we go along that you'd like to create some notes. Now, in chapter one, we're just talking about a lot of different various topics. Besides getting started with C Sharp, we always like to throw in a little bit of the old introduction to computing information so that you know a little bit of history. We want to make sure that everybody understands the difference between system and application software. Look at the steps of software development and maybe talk about some different programming methodologies, plans for putting things together. Why is C-Sharp important today? And what kind of applications can we create with C-Sharp? Finally, we'll look at an application written in C-Sharp and the basic elements of that program. In another video, we'll use Visual Studio to compile, run, build, and debug that very first application. Make sure it displays some output and see how all that works. And then you'll have a programming example to work through at the end of the chapter. Computing has been around for a while and us humans have always been trying to figure out ways to get things done easier. So you'll see that there's a lot of historical facts about computing. Babbage and Lady Ada Lovelace, very interesting story. Should look up some information about them. Pretty amazing people. Second generation programmers were using COBOL and Fortran. We'll still see Fortran being used in scientific applications, and we still see a lot of back-end COBOL systems in our uh, modern organizations. The third generation of computing, we saw you know, computers getting smaller and operating systems coming about. The fourth generation of computing, we saw PCs, and we're somewhere now in the fifth generation artificial intelligence and global communication. All along, we've had to be worried about systems and application software. And I think the difference becomes really obvious when we look at a phone. We have our system software, our iOS or Android application base software, and then we have apps that we can download. So when we're working with system software, the operating system, 
This is the realm of compilers and interpreters and other things that can take the source code we write as programmers and convert it into something that can be executed by the machine. Along in this process, it's important to understand a little bit about binary and how to do binary conversions. So please watch those videos if you're not sure how to do that. Make it um, something that you know how to do. When we are talking about application software, we're talking about creating computer applications using high-level programming languages like C Sharp and Java. Visual Basic is one that's kind of fallen out of favor, but it's still out, of, out there. These languages are all compiled or somewhat compiled, and a compiler is another program that just takes syntax and converts it into something that the computer can understand, a machine-readable form. We always have to follow the syntax rules for any programming language we're using. And we always need to remember that programming is just a process, a process of problem solving. It's always hard to figure out where to start, and there can be a number of different approaches or methodologies about how to get started. But no matter which methodology you follow, it's easier to be successful if you are following a certain approach. We are used to seeing these steps. As a developer, we want to analyze problems, design a solution to the problem, code the solution, implement it, and test it. Remember the software development process is iterative. It is always ongoing as we find errors. Sometimes we have to go way back up in the steps to fix those problems. In your textbook they have some great analysis documents, program analysis. These would be things that a user might write to say, could you please write this program for me? They're going to tell you what kind of data they have available, what kind of valid values can be used for those little different pieces of data, how will that data be input, and does data, is there any data that stays the same or remains constant? In this little example here, we have an application where we've decided that we need to keep track of the kind of vehicle, which we're going to keep track of in a char data type, a single character. And we want to keep track of how many days the person is going to have this rental car for, and we're going to keep track of that in an integer variable called no, no of days. Now, when we're devising solutions, lots of approaches, we can be very procedural, we can be very object-oriented, but no matter what, the more careful we are, the better our solution. We want our solution to look like it was easy, even though it may have been hard. One way we can do things is to divide and conquer, break this problem into smaller tasks. We can look from the top down and see how to solve these problems. Another approach is object-oriented, where we try to figure out which pieces of information constitute objects and what kind of data and actions those objects would have. In our case, we have developed this object called a rental car. The rental car can be illustrated using a class diagram and this diagram can be shared with others to make sure that we're understanding this problem properly. In our class diagram, we say that we have two data type values that we're going to keep track of. The kind of vehicle, which is a char data type, and the number of days that that vehicle is going to be kept, and it's an integer. We've added a little bit more and said that our rental car object is going to need to know how to calculate the charges. And when it calculates charges, it's going to do so in a method or subprogram called compute charges. And that subprogram is going to return a double data type value to the caller to let them know how much the charges would be. That class diagram was divided into the three sections. 
the top identifying the name of our class, the middle identifying the data characteristics associated with that rental car class, and the bottom showing what actions could be performed. In your 120 class or in your previous experience, you've probably seen some design tools like flowcharts and pseudocode, and those are things that you should have an understanding of that help you to create a solid foundation. Remember that programming algorithms, we want to document them in a clear way, and we want step-by-step -step pro processes documented so that we know how to solve problems. We want to make sure each step is completely outlined so precisely that we know all the details. We want the instructions to, to be simple and we want our instructions to be carried out in a finite amount of time. They can't just be taking forever. No matter what, we want the same results to occur if our instructions are followed. We're finally going to be ready to code our solution. We're going to look at IDE. Visual Studio is an integrated development environment, or IDE, that helps us code our program, compile it, run it, and debug it all in one place. When we're using Visual Studio and C Sharp, as we compile, our source code is going to be converted into an intermediate language. This intermediate language is between the high level and the native code. And it's not really executable on any computer. And it's not tied to any specific platform. So it's kind of platform independent. Then the common language runtime is going to take that intermediate language code and interpret it to run it on the platform that we're using. I think that's a good thing for a note. There might be some other things that we've seen, but I'm going to bring up my notebook here and say that C sharp. And if you notice, you can just start typing with Visual Studio it is compiled into an intermediate language. Now that intermediate language is used by the CLR, the Common Language Runtime. Now the CLR loads things that we may say we're dependent on in our program code, like classes and different things, and then actually creates a second compilation, a just-in-time compile is performed. And this just-in-time compile is based on our current platform. So let's put that in there, just-in-time, our just-in-time compile is platform dependent. So compile for the platform, and we could add up here that our I.O. is platform independent. We don't care if we're going to be running that on Windows or on a Linux machine or what the case may be. As long as .NET is there with its common language runtime to run the program, we'll be good to go. All right, now we're going to use some test-driven development at this point and test our program and make sure that everything is working properly because, first of all, we could have logic errors that could cause our program to cancel. And whenever we see a cancellation or a runtime error, we know that's always a problem with the program. We have some different methodologies, again, to write our programs. We can write them in a structured manner that was developed back in the 70s, or we can write in an object-oriented manner that was kind of developed by Steve Jobs in the 80s, right? So really still kind of an older style, but a couple of different options for us. 
Now, whenever we're talking about procedural programming, this might seem to be the easier way at first. It's kind of like building a house. We are going to write each of our subprograms as separate functions and methods, and we're going to have kind of a main function that controls everything. There are some drawbacks to this kind of programming. It can be more difficult to maintain these programs, and there's less opportunity to reuse our code. We're doing a lot of different things. If we do object-oriented programming, those tools you saw, kind of some, some procedural tools like flowcharts and pseudocode, object-oriented programming design methodologies and building of our code um, gives us an opportunity to construct some more complex systems that are really modeled after the real world. So it gives us the opportunity to really have a better handle on designing our components. And this is kind of based on the assumption that the world contains entities that can be identified and described. So through abstraction, we can think about the data and the processes on the data of different entities. So for a quick example, if I were writing a class that had to do with, with pets, I might want to keep track of data that had to do, you know, what type of pet I had. Is it a cat or a dog? The name of my pet. Um, I might want to keep track of what kind of food it likes to eat what kind of sounds it makes. And then through the behaviors, I would actually implement what the pet might do, like to eat. He might eat a certain amount of that food that he likes, or to speak, he might, you know, say out loud the sound that he was associated with his data. So I could keep track of my pet object in that way. And we'll look at this a lot as we go through our different programming styles. Encapsulation is this process of adding the data and these, these behaviors together to form an object. And that object is defined as a class. And then there's another component called polymorphism. And this is where I can have one thing named something, and I can have that one thing do a different task depending on where it is in the class structure. So maybe in my pet structure, I could have my sound method say what kind of sound this pet makes but I could also morph that, and if I had an owner type class, I could have that sound be more of a, a voice thing, and that would mean that I could have speak as a method name in both cases. And if I were working with a pet, I would say the pet sound, and if I were working with a person, I would say the human sound. That's polymorphism, a way for me to morph things from one thing to another. Now, this is a more involved class diagram. It shows a student, the fields that would be associated with that student in the middle and in the bottom section, the methods or behaviors associated with that student. Back to a little bit of history, talking about programming languages here. We really started programming in the 40s and that's not that long ago compared to how long some other fields have existed, if you think about, you know, when nurses started nursing and things. But it has been a little while. In the 50s, we used languages like assembly, some really low-level languages. And then in the late 50s, we started seeing more high-level languages. Today, they say there's more than 2,000 high-level 
languages, so you could probably argue with people forever about which language is best. Should you write things with the old native C or maybe C++ because you want to do some bit manipulation? Or should you use C Sharp because you want some things to be taken care of for you like garbage collection? Or should you use Java because you want your program to be able to run forever and you, or any place and you know C Sharp can, but you're not exactly sure how? Or maybe you're stuck in Visual Basic land. So many different options, Lua. I know you've heard of a billion. Now, .NET is kind of a thing. It's not really an operating system. It's like a layer. And so this layer gives us the ability to run our programs on Windows and on Linux and on any other type of operating system that .NET exists on. So we are dependent on .NET, and .NET can run wherever um, Microsoft would like and it has become open source so we can see it running on many different platforms. Now this screenshot shows us a very small C Sharp program that's running and it's giving a message in a little message box that says welcome to programming. We can do that within Visual Studio. We'll see. Now why you might be interested in learning C Sharp it is a newer language and it is still being developed, which is nice. It has new features. C++ and C Sharp are both developed on the original C programming language developed in the 60s. Um, a lot of Linux and Unix operating systems were developed using C and I think Windows was as well. It's not based necessarily on C anymore. Now, whenever we we're looking with C Sharp, we have some rapid development tools for graphical user interfaces, which are super nice. And we have the benefits of object-oriented class libraries like Java. We can create lots of different types of applications, like components that we don't necessarily see that just do things for us. We could create mobile apps using Xamarin. We could run them on iOS or Android. We can create dynamic web pages, ASP.NET web, web pages. We can access databases with ease. We can create Windows desktop applications. So many things. Here's a web application written using C Sharp and ASP.NET. It's pretty neat. Windows applications. You're used to seeing applications like this on a Windows platform. Console applications are a little bit different. We don't interact with them as much as we used to, but yet they're kind of making a comeback. What goes around comes around. And finally, our first C Sharp program. We're going to write this program using Visual Studio in another video, but let's take a quick look. First of all, when we're looking at C Sharp code, we have specific syntax rules that we have to follow. These rules can seem kind of confining at first, but you'll get used to them. First of all, a comment can be created using two slash characters. It's usually shown in green. We see keywords shown in blue, like namespace. We have lots of different types of comments. You'll see those in your book. We'll be using the three forward slashes. In your textbook, they say that we won't be using those, but I'll be encouraging you to use these XML type comments. I'll show them to you. Now, one of the first lines of code in our program is the using statement. And the using statement just says, hey C Sharp, I'd like to use this library that you've created for me. It's called a compiler directive because it just says I want this included in my program. So let's add that to our notes. If I didn't lose my thing there, there it is. So I'm going to add a page here for syntax, and I'm going to say first of all, 
we have this using, and I don't want it to be uppercase. Silly word, always autocorrecting us, huh? Using live name, and I'll put a semicolon at the end of that, because if you've noticed, that's the syntax. Now, I can go ahead and maybe change my font color here. Um, let's see, I'll make it blue, and I'll say down under here, this is the using statement. A library to be used. And we saw that using system was common. I'll try to fight this again. There's a nice common example for us. Now, the next syntax that we have is the namespace. And the namespace is kind of a grouping that gives us like the table for the captain here. So it's, it gives us a way to group related things under a single umbrella. So whenever we're looking at our using statement, we're actually pulling in a namespace and we use that system one most often. But we can create our own namespaces and that's the next syntax that we need to keep track of in our notes. So I will put that down here. Namespace. And again I'm going to have to fight. And then it's going to be I'm going to do a control I to put it in italics namespace name. And then after that I want an opening curly brace and a closing curly brace. Now that's going to give me my namespace syntax, which is outside of all of my code, so very important. If you notice, the namespace started with the keyword namespace, and then we gave it a name, and then there was an opening curly brace, and at the end of the whole namespace was a closing. So in this example, our namespace name is Hello World Program. And then within our opening and closing curly braces will be the code that we're going to add, the body of the namespace. Now the next piece that we need to add is the class. The class statement allows us to create a, an object type within our program, but we can also um, use it within the directive statement. So I could add a statement saying using static system.console and that says that I want to use the console class. And I'm going to put that in here. Up here by our using, I could say using static system.console. So in this case I do want the S to be capitalized but not the U. And I want my semicolon at the end. And so this is going to be a very common statement for me. And what that means is anything that from, is from the console class of the system namespace does not have to be prefixed in our code. And you'll see what that means as we go along. Be a little vague at this point, I understand. Now the rest of the code that we have in our program is um, two lines, the right line statement and the read key statement, and those are going to be within a method, and a method in C Sharp is just a subprogram, and we have to have that within our class. So let's see. A class has then a class name and then an opening curly brace 
and a close and curly brace. So our class is inside the namespace. And we can add some arrows here if we want to. I'll draw. Let's see. I want to draw something. Mm. I'll use blue and I want to put that this class is inside the namespace. And you could probably draw better than me. And then I'll go back to my clicking tool. I'm not being able to get rid of my draw mode here. I just want to go back to type. I couldn't find it. It's getting late. All right. So my class goes within my namespace in my beautiful drawing here. And then inside my class, I'm going to have some data members and maybe some methods that perform some actions. And the most important method I'm going to have is my main. The main is always the entry point for a C Sharp program. It's where the program begins and execution ends after the last statement in the main. So it can be anywhere inside of any class, but we have to have a main method. And it always begins with an uppercase M. So we're going to start with the word static, void, main. The word static is something we'll talk about in a minute, in another chapter. Then the return type of this method, which void means it's not going to return anything. The name of the method, which is main, in parentheses, just for arguments. And we don't have any arguments for this program, so we'll just have empty parentheses. In chapter three, we'll talk about methods in a lot more detail. For now, just know that you have to have your main method. So let's add that into our notes. I have to have a method. It's going to be static void main. And inside my main is going to be where my code is. Code goes here. Okay, I'll try that drawing again. I know it's a little blustery. So, my main goes within my class. My class goes within my namespace. Now I am using these two lines of code that we'll talk about a little bit more in the video that we're going to do that talks about creating this program using Visual Studio. And we're really ready to do that in your textbook. Do go through this area where they talk about the escape sequences. Remember backslash n moves our output to a new line. Backslash t does a tab character. They have many items listed in this table. Now this elements picture kind of is an overview of the things that I've been pointing to with our beautiful arrows in our OneNote notebook that we have this framework class library like system and we can create our own namespace so inside that framework we have the namespace inside a namespace we have a class inside of a class we can have methods and a method is comprised of programming statements so we'll be working with this hierarchy of code throughout all of our c-sharp lessons and we'll be ready to create our first 
C sharp application using the IDE. Again, like I said in another video, because this one is probably plenty long enough. So I hope you get off to a good start. You know, if you have any problems, thank you.